Okay, so here is another example. Uh, we can um, use state machines to model the uh, execution of threads. Um, you know, here we just want to show you this example. Um, in in this diagram, we have two threads, and we use a kind of state diagram to represent uh, the um, states and also transitions between these states. And here, each of the states uh, or transitions represent atomic instructions. Um, you, if you choose one machine, um, one state, you will advance to the next state if guards are satisfied, uh, like we talk about our uh, finite state machine. In this particular example, there are four states for thread one, another four states for thread two. Um, they share some of the states um, uh, and the transitions are uh, a little bit different. Um, the question here is, um, can threat one be in C1 at the same time threat two is in C2 state? Um, let's look at this example. So the threads are um, executing independently, but still they have um, one major attribute of these threads is that they share variables and they share um, the states. Um, so if you have thread one in, that, in state C1 and thread two in state C2, what will happen is um, this thread two, when it stays at C2, and when it evaluates C1, which is true because thread one is in C1. So C1, this guard satisfies. So you take this transition and to um, um, migrate to C, uh, B2. And also threat one will see at that moment C, um, C2 is true. So this guard satisfies. As a result, um, the threat one will transit to B1. Now the same other thing happens because B1 and B2 are all um, true. So um, the threat one will take another transition and similarly threat two will take another transition. So it's kind of an interleaving um, transition um, that this will become a a very dynamic process. Um, so they will repeat this uh, forever. So this particular case that uh, it's uh, not possible for threat one and two to stay exact C1 and C2 states all the time. Um, what we want to do in this example really to, is to show the um, dynamics uh, between threads, um, because they share uh, variables, share states. Uh, so this has a significant impact on their um, operations. Um, next, we wanna use a scenario from the uh, aviation industry uh, to explain a common software practice uh, using uh, modular avionics um, hardware, uh, in these cyber physical systems, the software in the aircraft engine continuously run uh, diagnosis and also publish the diagnosis data on the local network um, to all the other software systems and hardware systems uh, on the local uh, network. These diagnosis data may include the engine status, uh, temperature, um, the oil tank, um, you know, capacity, um, you know, all these uh, important uh, metrics about the aircraft. Um, and there are a lot of other systems will 
have to respond based on these uh, data metrics. Um, and also on the other hand, there'll be um, so-called observers uh, or um, consumers of these data. Um, for example, if you have a um, engine status you know, rating uh, number or engine speed number um, coming from the sensors, you want to display that number um, to uh, different uh, you know, onboard display units so that the pilots can see, can observe, or some other um, control uh, units will use the data to uh, trigger any alerts, uh, initiate any um, fault tolerance or uh, safety measures. So there'll be different uh, consumers of this data uh, to re react on these data. So one side, there's a um, producer of data and on the other side, there'll be many consumer of the data. Um, and that's what we call the observer um, process, uh, which for example, can update the uh, cockpit display based on notifications from the engine about the, uh, its status. So in practice, the software designers will use uh, this so-called observer pattern that we'll, we'll talk about to um, um, map the data uh, from one to many consumers uh, or observers of the data. This is so-called the observer pattern that defines a one to many dependency between a subject uh, uh, and, it, and uh, any number of observer objects. So that when the subject object changes states, all its observer objects are notified and updated automatically. Now, the way you understand the object here is really the uh, software instances. And in our case, that's you know, the thread. Uh, it's ideal um, application of these threads where one thread <clears throat> is gonna generate data and um, maybe one or many other threads will be uh, utilizing the data to perform a control uh, or send to display units uh, or, um, or trigger any uh, safety measures. So this is a very typical threat programming problem. Okay, if you implement this observer pattern in C code, what we we'll expect is uh, we'll have something uh, like this. Uh, we will declare a, a value that, that is used um, to record the status and also trigger notification of registered listeners. And we'll look at what is the listener uh, functions for this case. Uh, listeners is, um, you can think about it, it's a um, list of pointers to notification procedures or pointers to functions. And we define this notify procedure as a, um, a function that returns a, no, a void type pointer and takes one argument integer. And we also declare a, declare a struct called element, which will help us to build a list. And we will uh, type def this kind of structure as element type, and it will declare a head and tail so that we can build this linked list. And then we have a procedure to add a listener to the list and also we have a procedure to update the value um, so that the listeners, um, the um, functions can be called using this new value. And the exact procedure to call will notify, it's uh, simply a print function. So this is the overall um, items uh, or code that we should have in this C program. But when we look into this further, what we show here is the, um, element structure. So the first is the, the notify procedure, um, this, um, this uh, function pointer that we'll use to initialize the listeners. And this element structure is a um, node in the 
linked list. What we have here is um, as the element um, node, this notify procedure is um, the listener function. So we're gonna um, initialize this as a function pointer. That's gonna be some type of this, this type of function. Um, and then we will use the next um, item on the structure to record the pointer to the next element. So if you're familiar with linked list, I'm sure you took data structure courses or used this linked list before, you know, this is how we build a linked list. We have a, the item uh, in this node, and then we have a pointer to the next item. Um, there's a pointer to the next node on this linked list. Okay. Um, and for the add listener procedure, uh, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this function pointer as the argument. Basically, we want to um, add another node and then initialize the node so that it points to uh, this listener function. In this uh, procedure, we uh, call it add listener. We basically, we grow the linked list. We're gonna check if the linked list has never been initialized. In that case, uh, it has no nodes in this linked list. So the head, uh, the head pointer is a null. In this case, we're gonna create the first node on this linked list. So we do malloc, I create this um, node. And then we're gonna initialize the listener function. So this is the pointer and we're gonna assign this listener pointer to this um, um, field in this node, in this element node. This listener is the one that passed in and this listener is the field that's part of this node. And then the head next is a null pointer because this is the very first node that we created. Um, so that's why there's nothing um, after this. So this is the only node. So the tail uh, gonna be also pointing to this head node. So you essentially create the first node uh, um, on this linked list. If you already have a node uh, on this linked list, then you're gonna you know, execute this path in this case, we're gonna grow at the tail. Um, so we're gonna um, create a new node by using malloc. And since tail is the last node, so I'm gonna you know, basically put the new node as it's next. If I do this, uh, um, this tail uh, next, um, it was a null pointer. That's where you had here. And so I'm gonna grow that. So I'm gonna add a new, new created node to this tail. And I'm gonna move the tail to the new node. Uh, so the new node is now the new tail. Then I'm gonna um, um, put the listener, this um, function pointer that we pass in as the listener field of this newly created tail node. And then we, we say this is the last one. So the tail uh, next is now a null pointer. So this function, this procedure to create, to add a listener to the list is a very typical way you grow the linked list and initialize the um, uh, fields of this new node that's just created. Hope you guys are following. Any questions? There's one question. Okay. One question. Um, next procedure is the update. So update, think about you received the um, new uh, sensor status from the engine. Um, you want to broadcast it to all the nodes on the linked list. So every node has a function pointer and you want to pass this new value to these functions so that they can be called. Um, so this is what we do. Um, this update procedure takes this new 
value as the input argument. And so this value here um, stores the new value. And uh, we will um, then notify the listeners. And um, so we will go from the head. Um, if there's no nodes created ever, uh, this will be a null. So uh, this while loop will be skipped. But if there's any node, we're gonna start from the head. Uh, we're gonna say, we'll call this listener. Now, this is how we use the function pointers if you have never done this before. Because element, um, this arrow listener, this is a function pointer. And when you use this uh, adversic, you are um, basically calling this function. Okay? You are you know, referring this function and you add this parenthesis because the next thing you wanna do is to pass in this value as the argument to this function, which is pointed by this listener, okay? So this is how we, um, we do the function calls. If you just use listener pointer, um, this arrow uh, listener, element arrow listener, this is the function pointer. When you, if you wanna call the function, you add this asterisk, and then you will um, then supply the input arguments. So we're gonna call that. And then we're gonna, uh, after that function completes, we'll move on to the next node on the linked list. So we're gonna move to the next one and then check again uh, until you, are, you finish going through all the nodes on this linked list. Okay, so this update function, even though it only has a few lines, it actually might take a long time because this linked list, all the functions on this linked list will be called one by one. And this is how we call them. Okay, so what we, um, Showing here is another way to understand this update procedure. The code on the right side is what we saw just now. Uh, we have a um, update function. Uh, we use a new X as the argument that we pass in. And we use um, this while loop to go through uh, every node on the linked list. So let's say we start from here. This is the first state because the default transitions are here. Um, we will, um, when we have an argument, we will um, go to it's here. So we'll assign this uh, argument to new x uh, because you know somebody else called this function, and then. Uh, the new x assigned to um, this under variable x, which we, actually we don't use here during these several lines. Um, then we move on to uh, line 31. Um, 31 is where we assign um, element to the first node on the linked list. Uh, that's always gonna be true. It will finish that line uh, and then you know, and the action is to assign uh, the head pointer to this element. Now, starting from line 32, we're gonna go through um, some um, loops. Uh, we will do the loop if element is not zero. If it is zero, then we're gonna actually take this um, path. So we are done. We're gonna be back to where we started. If this element is not zero, uh, we're gonna move on to the next line, which is line 33. What line 33 does is it will um, call these uh, um, uh, line uh, listener function. It will um, use the new X as the input argument to call that function. And that's always gonna be true because there's you know, 
and that's the next line has to execute. Um, line 34 um, is, um, yeah, line 34 is where we will have to move on to the next uh, element. And that get back us to line 32. And um, you know, eventually, uh, by the way, so from line 32 to line, from line, from line four, uh, 34 to line 32, the condition is that you return from listener because this listener function depends on what it does. It may take certain amount of time. Um, so it transitioned from um, 32 uh, to um, 34 to 32 only after this uh, element listener finishes. Okay, so um, this is a um, interesting same machine that we can use to capture the execution of this um, procedure. Okay, so we went through the several important procedures um, at listener update, and we saw how we create the link list uh, by adding new nodes at the end of the list. And also we saw uh, in the update, how do we uh, use uh, the link list to access all the listener functions and call them. So we have a few questions here. Um, well, the central question here is, will this work in a multi-threaded context? So everything what you, you saw just now, you know, looks reasonable. Um, if you remember the code that we used to create in the link list, seems it, it properly considered different cases when the head is null, so there's no nodes, and how what do we do? If there is already nodes, and we'll add new ones at the end. Uh, we'll, when we do the uh, update, we'll go through the link list call the functions one by one until we finish um, iterating the, the nodes in the link list. So everything seems perfect. Um, but then we have um, potion, potentially serious issues when we do this in a multi-threaded environment. And that's what we're gonna discuss in the uh, next 10, 20 minutes. This is the procedure that we saw earlier, add a listener to the list. Okay. Um, so if the head is zero, we're gonna create a new one and we have the head pointing to the new node and also tail pointing to new node. If there's already nodes, uh, we are gonna um, create a new one and assign it to the uh, end of the tail, and then we're gonna um, move the tail and um, initialize the function pointers and then um, put the next to be a zero and so on. Now imagine what we have here, the same code, but now being executed by two threads. And it's, it's typically, um, it's you know, perfectly possible because um, this is a program that you write um, for all these functions, um, for most of the functions, um, you can have a way to wrap them and then execute um, in a thread. Um, when you have two threads, let's say, you know, thread A and B are executing and thread A um, gets to this point, it does allocation, okay? Um, it tries to add a new node at the tail of this linked list. So it finishes this um, malloc. So the tail 
Next, pointing to the newly allocated node. Now, unfortunately, at this point, the threat scheduler um, decide to suspend this current thread. So at this point, it's not ex executing the next line. Threat B is now being executed. The threat B also get to this point, it'll execute this allocation and it will assign this newly allocated um, um, memory to the tail next. But guess what? They are accessing the same variable. This tail is the same, but now the, um, the, um, the node which was just allocated by thread A will be lost because now the tail next pointing to the very last uh, new node that was just created. And subsequently, this tail next will be overwritten. So the, uh, the original, um, the, the, the one, the, the node which was allocated by thread A will be, you know, you know just uh, uh, there's no way you can recover it. Um, and of course you have um, serious issues with memory allocation and also uh, the, um, the tail pointers will be now pointing to the wrong location. Um, I hope I can have a better picture to visualize this, but I hope you um, can follow what I was just described. It's because these tail and this also head variables are shared by these multiple threads. So if at any point these sequences are interrupted or interleaved between these different threads, these pointers will be incorrectly assigned or initialized, the value will be um, not um, properly uh, setting up these um, uh, continuous link list. So that's the danger we are facing when you have multiple threads um, executing concurrently. And when they access shared variables, which they can, because all these variables are shared, um, and then they will cr create serious problems. Um, this is called race condition, which essentially is the concurrent code trying to access the same resource, uh, i.e. the um, shared variables. In order to address this problem, uh, we need to use um, so-called mutually exclusive clocks or mutex, so that whenever we try, try to access the shared variables, we should have um, a way to protect them uh, from this um, unintended concurrent accesses uh, to make sure the um, operation is still uh, valid uh, or producing um, uh, valid results. Um, here's one possible solution. Uh, we use so-called p-thread mutex lock. Mutex lock stands for mutually exclusive um, locks. Uh, we will have to declare this lock uh, at the very beginning. Um, so it's a p-thread mutex lock. It's called the lock. Um, this uh, variable name is lock. And um, we have, um, When we use um, the um, link list, for example, add listener, uh, we will uh, we have the code that we saw earlier uh, to grow the link list. Uh, so we'll have to protect that so that uh, uh, only one of the threads will be able to access uh, these shared variable. And once we finish, uh, we'll have to release the lock. Um, so that's why you see this lock and unlock pair appear in this add listener uh, function. 
And correspondingly, we also need to have um, these um, mutex lock applied in the update function because in the update function, you also access the linked list. So when you try to access this linked list, um, chances are if you don't do this, uh, the um, listener, add listener procedure will try to add a new uh, node um, in to this um, linked list. But during that process, uh, if you uh, interrupt at different places, it may happen that the tail of the um, pointer points to a unintended location. And when you, if you don't have this lock, then this while loop will possibly uh, access a um, node which has its listeners not initialized yet. Because if I go back, uh, this is where we initialize the listener. So if for some reason this uh, thread uh, is uh, interrupted or suspended at this point before the listener pointer is initialized, then this update function, we need to go through the linked list. It may happen to see a uninitialized listener pointer. And if you use that to make this function call, then that will cause a uh, segmentation error. Now, we seem to have a solution, um, but we unintentionally, we have a, a potential um, deadlock risk. Deadlock risk is where you are trying to, um, you have more than one lock and uh, the one of the uh, thread, one of the instances running instances or thread uh, holds a lock and it tries to acquire another one. And on the other hand, um, you have another thread which already acquires the second lock but trying to acquire the first lock. In this case, um, the threads will both hold one lock but still trying to acquire the other lock. And that's where the deadlock happens. Uh, in this code, we didn't show that the second lock, but uh, it may happen, for example, this listener function. In this listener function, because it used um, a lot of the shared variables, you may have to use another lock to protect another shared variable. In that case, you may have a second lock or even more than two locks, and that will, um, you know, um, that will be the potential risk to have uh, deadlock situations. There was um, some solutions, but you know none of those turned out to be universally, um, you know, correct or uh, guarantee there's uh, no deadlocks. Uh, even this um, the project from Berkeley, they had a lot of code review of this um, Ptolemy projects. Um, they had code, view, code, code review um, and found um, a situation the threat was not safe. Uh, they fixed this threat, but uh, later on um, the deadlock uh, showed up in a test suite. So deadlocks are really uh, a very hard problem to, to solve. Um, it, uh, it, it's not obvious and not all the test cases can reveal the problem. Uh, it requires a lot of um, verification using tools uh, to, to uh, analyze the code. Um, even that, you know, sometimes it's not guaranteed that deadlocks can be discovered. Um, one possible fix of that is to use copies of shared variables. Uh, in this case, uh, we copied the list of listeners before we uh, access them. Um, so this will um, reduce the possibilities of uh, deadlock uh, and also avoid the race conditions. 
Um, so here between these log and analog, we will make a copy of the list of listeners. And, and so and when we get out of here, uh, we will use the new copy um, to go through the length list. So in this way, they will um, not be able, um, they will reduce the, the um, condition, the uh, risk of the deadlocks. Um, but there's also uh, issues with this design in a sense that if the uh, model, multiple threads call the update function, um, the update uh, will occur in some order, but still there's no uh, guarantee that the listeners will be notified in the same order. So if you have a new value, uh, it, there's because the listeners will be, um, you know, this part of the execution will be um, non-deterministic. So the listeners may um, have, may see the old value or not the most recent value. So if you, um, you know, use that to, let's say, update the display uh, in the uh, uh, cockpit display uh, in aircraft, uh, you may, you know, seeing the new value and the new old value, um, you know, mixed up um, in certain cases. So listeners may not be um, able to get the uh, the final value of the shared variable. 